now uh, very pleased to introduce Owain Evans and Victoria Krakowna. So uh, Owain works on AI safety and reinforcement learning at the Future of Humanities Institute at the University of Oxford. Uh, he also leads a project on inferring human preferences with Andreas Stuhlmuller of Alt.org. Um, he has published papers at NIPS and AAAI and an online interactive textbook at agentmodels.org. Um, his recent um, collaboration surveying AI experts is forthcoming in the Journal of AI Research. Uh, Victoria is a research scientist at DeepMind. Uh, she's working on AI safety. She did her PhD in machine learning and statistics at Harvard um, on building interpretable models. She also co-founded the Future of Life Institute, a non-profit organization working to mitigate uh, technological risks to humanity and increase the likeliness of a positive outcome. So please join me in welcoming um, Owain and Victoria. Thank you all for joining us today for um, the careers in AI safety session. Um, first, I will talk about uh, the kind of research problems that come up in this area and some of the things we've been working on. And I'll hand it over to Owain to tell you about um, how to get into the field. So in terms of technical AI safety research, um, there are two major perspectives on the research agenda. Uh, on the one hand, we have the machine learning perspective that's uh, represented by the concrete problems in AI safety paper. So if you haven't read that one yet, I highly recommend. And this is basically about um, the kind of problems that are likely to arise with advanced AI systems in the future and are likely to be serious problems um, that already come up in some form for present day machine learning systems. So we can have uh, some sort of feedback loop, uh, like an empirical feedback loop in terms of working on these problems on present day systems while keeping an eye for general solutions that might generalize to future systems that are much more advanced. On the other hand, we have the agent foundations agenda, um, which was um, developed by Miri, and they're focusing on uh, really foundational problems in aligning super intelligent systems such as decision theory and logical uncertainty. Um, both of these research directions are really important, uh, but in this talk, we are going to focus on the machine learning perspective on technical AI safety. <laughs> machine learning safety research uh, can be seen as um, being divided into two broad, two broad categories which is um, specification and robustness. So specification problems are about making sure that we can specify human preferences to AI systems in a reliable way, and that if our specifications are incorrect, then our agents can still sort of figure out how to, how to do the right thing, and how to do what we want them to do, and not just what we say that we want them to do. Well, robustness problems, um, are about reliably learning to satisfy a specification. So on the specification side, you have things like reward gaming, where basically if you have, for example, a reinforcement learning agent, and you give it a reward function, then if your reward function doesn't perfectly represent what you want it to do, then uh, the agent might find a loophole and get lots and lots of reward without doing what you want. Here, unfortunately, we don't have the video, but uh, OpenAI had this awesome demo where the agent was supposed to be playing a boat race game. So the boat was supposed to go around the track as fast as possible um, and complete the race. But instead, it found that it could just go in a little circle and hit the same targets over and over again and get lots of reward without actually playing the game. This kind of thing is sort of fun to watch in a game video, but uh, less fun if your agent is actually trying to do something important in the world. Um, interruptibility is another big problem that has to do with being able to uh, turn our agents off when, um, you know, when we need to fix bugs or when we need to change their objectives and so on. And the issue here is that um, 
if the agent understands that it's going to get less reward if it's turned off than if it's not turned off, then it has an incentive to uh, change its policy or change its actions to avoid being turned off. And one tricky thing about trying to solve this problem is that we don't only want our agents to not uh, resist being turned off, but we also want them to not seek being turned off. So we don't want them to cause trouble just so that we would turn them off. So we have to kind of align the incentives so that they are exactly different to being turned off, which can be hard. Yeah. Negative side effect um, is the problem of um, having the agent achieve an objective without causing unnecessary disruptions to its environment. For example, if you have a robot and you want it to carry a box from point A to point B, then you're implicitly asking it to carry that box without breaking the bars in its path or without you know, uh, bumping into humans, without scratching the furniture, et cetera, et cetera. So there are lots of these kind of common sense constraints that we want the agent to satisfy, but we don't want to have to specify them explicitly. And we want the agent to have some sort of general heuristic um, about not causing disruptions. Um, On the other hand, we have robustness problems. So even if your specification is perfect, then unsafe things might happen while the agent is learning to satisfy the specification. One issue that comes up a lot is distributional shift, where your training data might not be from exactly the same distribution as your test data. For instance, uh, maybe you trained your robot arm to pick up blocks, but you're testing it on picking up a mug. And we want our agents to fail gracefully in these situations. And safe exploration is what happens when the agent is trying to explore lots of different states so that it can find a good solution, but it gets into a state that it cannot recover from, like this unfortunate room bonus staircase. So basically, current reinforcement learning systems often have to explore all the states many times in order to find a good solution. But in practice, that is really undesirable uh, because some states are really not, not worth exploring. Adversarial perturbations are a method for, for example, taking this panda image and adding some tweaks to the pixel so it looks exactly like a panda to a human, but the, your neural net will be really, really confident it's a given. Uh, so basically, you can do this uh, with you know, not just neural networks, but also other machine learning systems. And you can take an image or a sound file or whatever, and tweak it a little bit and make the neural network misclassified with high confidence for a different system. Um, and right now, this has been a very popular research area. There has been lots of work, both on the attack side and defense side. But so far, as far as I can tell, the attack side is winning. Here are um, some of the recent work that we have been doing at DeepMind and FHI on these technical safety problems. And the first one, unfortunately, we don't have the video of the back flipping noodle. Um, uh, deep reinforcement learning from human preferences is um, paper about uh, teaching the agent some kind of complicated human preferences that we don't know how to specify directly. So for example, if we wanted to do a backflip, it's hard to design a reward function for doing a backflip. But it is something that we can know when we see it. So a human can look at two videos of the agent try to do a backflip and say, hey, that looks more like a backflip. So in this paper, uh, they use this kind of pairwise comparisons to allow the agent to efficiently learn how to do this kind of complex task. Yeah. And this is a collaboration between DeepMind and OpenAI. Um, and reinforcement learning with the corrupted reward channel is uh, a formalization of the problem of misspecified reward functions. Well, as you saw on the previous slide with the boat race uh, example, sometimes the observed reward uh, that the agent sees does not match what we could call the true reward, which is some kind of idealized reward function that represents what we really want the agent to do. So for example, if you look at the different trajectories that the agent could take, then for most of them, maybe the observed reward matches the true reward, but for that loop, we're just kind of hitting the same 
targets over and over again. There's high observed reward with low true reward. And in this paper, we kind of investigate what sort of extra information we could give the agent to enable it to figure out uh, what the true reward is, even in the presence of corruption, uh, where corruption is basically, a, a, we say a state is corrupt if the true and observed rewards don't match. Safely interruptible agents is uh, a paper on the interruptibility problem. This is basically a formalization uh, giving some, uh, you know, a definition of interruptibility and investigating what sort of agents are more likely to be interruptible. For example, it, they find that um, off-policy reinforcement learning agents are more likely to be interruptible than on-policy ones. And uh, yeah, there is a collaboration between DeepMind and FHI. And last but not least, we have um, trial without error, uh, which is a, uh, something that uh, Awine has been working on with Stanford. And here, um, basically they want to prevent the agent from taking catastrophic actions while it's learning. So at the beginning, there is a human that watches the agent learn and interferes whenever the agent is about to do something really bad. And there is a classifier that's trying to predict when the human is going to intervene. And eventually, when the, as the classifier is trained, the classifier can take over. And so the human doesn't have to kind of watch the agent forever. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything else about the paper. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Great. Um, so yeah, these are some of the things we have been working on in this area. And if you are excited to do this kind of work, then uh, Owen is going to tell you a bit about how to get into the field. Great, thank you. Um, so I think the field of AI is incredibly exciting at the moment. I don't think any field, maybe in human history, has illuminated some fundamental area of um, of science, in this case, the science of intelligence, as quickly and as accessibly as AI. Uh, and on top of that, so I think it's a very exciting time for AI, but also the AI safety problem, I think, is ever more important. Um, and so I think uh, there's lots of reason to get into this field. So these are some of the organizations um, that are involved. Um, probably by the time some of you finish undergraduate or PhD, there'll be more organizations, so this is not going to be the end of it, and many of these orgs are represented uh, in some form at this conference. So how do you get into this field? How do you end up at one of these organizations or somewhere else doing AI safety research? So the fundamentals, um, undergraduate degree, or if someone is going back to do an undergraduate, a second undergraduate degree, what do you need to cover? Um, this is really just a laundry list of courses, standard maths background, and uh, some programming, some fundamental kind of deep learning, machine learning, reinforcement learning. If you're interested in uh, more theoretical work, the kind that MIRI does, but other organizations uh, are doing as well, then um, more pure maths and computer science theory. If you're interested in uh, being a software engineer or research engineer, as it's sometimes called, um, where you're working from an engineering software engineering perspective on machine learning for AI safety, um, then doing more CS and software engineering. And kind of general tips for uh, the learning the fundamentals. So I'd recommend prioritizing harder courses, uh, acquiring research experience uh, as early as you can. Uh, so try, try to get your name on a paper. Uh, and find a mentor supervisor. It doesn't need to be someone famous. Um, it could be a grad student or a postdoc, um, but find someone, work closely with them, work on problems that they're excited about. And um, lots of these tips are about getting feedback early about whether you're a good fit for AI research and whether it's a good fit for you, so whether it's something you're going to enjoy. So take hard courses to find out um, if, you can, if you can handle them, if you enjoy them. Um, OK, so that's the fundamentals. Um, and then how do you actually get into uh, doing research? So um, I think the, the, the best background is still a PhD in machine learning um, for the kind of research that uh, people at DeepMind or OpenAI or at FH, much of the research at FHI 
uh, chai and so on. Um, there are some jobs that, that don't require a PhD, but this is a good default option. Um, and if you're doing a PhD, uh, definitely don't be afraid to do research outside AI safety as a way of learning and developing as a researcher, building up a set of collaborators. Um, PhD in Europe can sometimes be quicker, um, and there are some very good places in Europe, so don't rule that out. Um, there's general advice on how to do a PhD, going to, going to the major conferences, definitely a good idea, so building a network both of uh, AI researchers and people interested in AI safety. Um, and so alternatives to a PhD, so there are alternatives. Um, one thing you might do is try to get an internship at one of the groups doing AI research or AI safety research. You don't always need a PhD for this, um, and that can sometimes um, kind of bootstrap your, your career. Google Brain Residency is a great program explicitly aimed at um, taking people without PhD and getting them up to speed on contemporary deep learning research. Um, people have done great work there, so that's a good launching point for your career if you don't have a PhD or a master's. Um, research engineering is an option, especially at DeepMind or OpenAI, um, and so it's going to be closer there to the normal software engineering background. I can talk more about that in questions. Um, there are some machine learning startups. And um, Google, OpenAI, FHI, some organizations will hire people with PhDs in related fields. Um, so fields where you'll do um, similar kinds of maths or uh, statistics or programming. Um, and so people have come from all of these fields to these organizations. Um, so if you're doing, if you're, uh, fairly advanced in a PhD in those areas, then might just make sense to, to finish it. Okay. Um, and I just want to, we'll take questions in a sec, I just want to highlight um, some really great resources, which should be the first port of call. Uh, 80,000 Hours has amazing uh, resources online, and also well worth talking to them in person if you're interested in getting into this field. Um, uh, Vika has a list of recent AI safety fields and a, and a review. Um, and you should apply for jobs if you're interested. FHI has two AI safety jobs. And I'm, I'm always looking for interns. Um, and there are jobs at DeepMind as well, I guess. I don't know if you want to say anything there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you um, can apply to the safety team or also apply for internships. So uh, we have a couple of interns this year, and we'll probably have interns in future years. So, yeah, that's basically it. Great, okay, so we'll end there, thank you. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so you can still submit questions on, um, online. So, um, yeah, sort of first question, quite, quite generalist, but um, given uh, the sort of risks in the next sort of centuries or decades, why, why do you think this is um, sort of AI safety would be a priority in your, in your sort of opinion? So, like, why is AI safety a priority over, like, other cause areas? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, one thing about... Uh, sort of try to predict progress in AI is that it's very hard. And if you look at surveys of experts, like for example, the AI impact survey that came out recently, then you can see that there is just a huge variance in expert predictions on when you know, advanced AI or human level AI might be built. And basically, I think the takeaway from that is that we really don't know and the experts really don't know. So. It could, you know, it could potentially be 100 years. It could potentially be just a couple of decades away. And especially in the case that it might be sooner, uh, like it, it makes sense to start working on AI safety. And especially since a lot of these problems are quite difficult, both on the foundation side and on the machine learning side, we really need to start working on these now and not wait until we are certain that you know, advanced AI is upon us because that would be too late. And it also takes time to build 
uh, research community around safety and uh, really integrated with the machine learning community. And that's something that we are doing now and it's important to continue doing, I think. Um, what would you both consider um, is something that's maybe missing in the AI community currently? You mean the AI rather than AI safety? AI safety, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I can throw some things out there. I'd say, um, so, so one thing is the AI safety in some ways is a very difficult thing to study because the ultimate aim is to build systems that have, um, where we have some guarantee that the system is going to be safe, even if its capabilities are like far beyond the humans and far beyond maybe its initial state before it does any, any learning or something like that. And to get a guarantee, you need to rule out like every possible thing that could go wrong. Right? So you need some kind of, some evidence like that that you're sure that there's not going to be some mistake you've made. Um, and so you really need to be aware of the, the big picture. Um, and I think, um, there aren't maybe that many people combining the big picture thinking with the um, modular machine learning research, the kind of thing that can make it into papers. So one thing is it's difficult to write a paper where you address the whole big picture issue, given that it's got to fit into seven or eight pages. Um, but I think that um, it's really important to keep in mind both the, the big picture goal that you've got to have a system that is is kind of completely reliable and is able to deal with all kinds of, you know, you make sure all the possible holes are patched. Um, and at the same time, then doing incremental research that is modular and that other people can build on. I'd just like to add to that, that uh, yes, it is in fact quite helpful for more people to kind of keep the big picture in mind while looking at the machine learning safety problems and it would be good to you know, build more bridges between, for example, the foundation's agenda and the machine learning agenda, because right now they're still quite separate and there's not very, very much overlap, but potentially there could be problems that are sort of somewhere in the middle. And generally, there may well be more sort of unknown unknowns out there that we haven't thought about yet that are not on any of our agendas. And I think we need people to think outside the box and look for problems that may not have been discovered yet. Okay, great. Um, so given how many people are working in AI safety currently, um, how much more do you think we need, we need to scale this in the next decade? Two times more people, five times more people? Yes, well, if it was 10 times more people, I would uh, feel much happier about the state of the field, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, it's still quite small. And uh, I feel like there's a lot of difficult problems out there and uh, uh, I think that I mean, the, the existing researchers are making good progress, but it feels like right now it feels like there are too few of us to really kind of make solid pro progress on all these things. So, yeah, I think they can order of magnitude more, you know, really qualified and passionate researchers would be, I think that would be a, a big step. What do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. So it's still a tiny field. Um, so machine learning is not even that big an academic field. It will grow a lot. Um, it's much bigger at Google because they can act quickly. Academia, it's not so big. Um, but a huge proportion of machine learning is people doing things like um, labeling images. So you know, finding a cat in the image and like draw a box around the cat. There's a huge amount of research in that problem, which is you know important and useful and so on. Um, there's like a um, huge amount of research on ad clicks, basically, things like that, predicting when people will click on an ad. And there's really a tiny amount of work on fundamental problems in AI safety. Um, and I think if there were more people doing it, it would be very clear that there are lots of hard problems for those people to sink their, sink their teeth into, mm -hmm. um, and lots of interesting directions. So yeah, I think, I think it can grow, like, grow a lot. Yeah, so on that point, so what do you think is currently being done to sort of gain that? Um, order of magnitude growth in, in safety research? Um, I would say OpenPhil is, is Open Philanthropy Project is doing amazing work uh, funding academic researchers and uh, groups like OpenAI. Um, 
Uh, FHI is hiring and scaling up. I uh, can't speak, you know, DeepMind is hiring, I guess. Yeah, I think we are still looking for more people to work on safety. Um, I think, yeah, at the moment, I see this as being mostly a kind of qualified talent bottleneck. So we need more people who are both, both have the like, research experience and qualifications and are passionate about AI safety. And just to, to give a, a plug, I'm, I'm on the board of a new a small AI safety nonprofit funded by Open Plan 3 Project, uh, which is called ORT.org. It's going to be based in San Francisco. Uh, website's not live yet. Um, but if you want to work on AI safety, have a software engineering background maybe, or a research background, want to live in San Francisco, work with some great people. Um, there are new opportunities there. And so we're, I'm working to to try and have there be other centers of this kind of research, which I think is important. And uh, uh, the Future of Life Institute had a grant program at some point to uh, fund kind of a higher diversity of uh, teams to work on these problems. And there should be a second grant round. I'm not sure exactly when, but uh, I think it's going to exist. So uh, I think one thing that's important both for the pipeline and for solving the problems is to uh, have more different teams working on the problems from different angles and from different perspectives, because especially with uh, a field that's a little bit speculative in the sense that we are trying to predict what future systems are going to be like and what issues will arise. It's important that we try to approach these problems from different perspectives so that some of us will be right, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and if you want to um, pick their minds at all, um, uh, both Owain and Victoria, and actually Andrew from the previous talk, will be hosting um, or will be having um, office hours now, which I believe is actually on this floor. Um, we have a break now until 3.45, so if you could join me in um, really thanking Owain and Victoria for their time.